All right, so let's start looking at specific groups of Hemiptera, which you will run into as a vet or some sort of person who works with animals or humans. So, the most medically important groups of Hemiptera are those that feed on blood, right? That just kind of makes sense. These bites can often be painless, uh, but they have the, the danger of transmitting pathogens. And this is where all the problems happen in that vector capability. The major group that we're going to spend our time on is the family Reduviidae. Okay, the Reduviides, um are a large, you know, relatively large family of, of uh, insects that tend to feed on blood. And they have one particular subfamily, the Triatemini. These are the kissing bugs. So the kissing bugs, you've probably heard of these, at least apart from when I mentioned them last a lecture. But these kissing bugs are ectoparasitic obligate blood feeders. Okay, so they need to feed on the blood of living organisms. They require this blood for both growth and for reproduction. So there's about 138 of these species that have been described, and the majority of these insects are found in the New World. So they're found over here in North and South America. So this makes them especially important if you're going to stay in this region when you become your future vet or your future doctor. The nymphs and the adults of both sexes will feed on blood. So this isn't like, say, uh, certain organisms where it's only the female, like the mosquitoes, uh, feed on blood. Everybody feeds on blood. It's more like the ticks in this uh, regard. They can also survive starvation for many, many months. So this isn't one of those insects that uh, you could just keep them away from their blood meal for a couple of days and they're going to die, like some of the lice that we looked at. Instead, they can go months without a blood meal and they can handle it. They're like ticks again, like that. Now, we call them kissing bugs because primarily they are nocturnal species, uh, and they feed on sleeping humans and animals, and they focus on the face. Now, some people will also call them cone noses, and if you look at that uh, facial region there on this insect that you can see on this slide, that's because the shape of their head looks like a cone. You know, the nose is a cone, so that's pretty straightforward. Cone noses or kissing bugs. There's also a couple of other... Uh, common names, but those are the two uh, ones that you're most likely to hear in most regions of the country. So members of this group range from about 5 to 45 millimeters in length, with the majority of the species falling in the range of about 20 to 28 millimeters. Most are black or dark brown, and they can have these contrasting patterns of yellow or orange or red, so stripes or spots or things like that. The head of an adult is constricted posteriorly, and so it forms this distinctive neck region right behind the acelli. They have this, these large hemispherical compound eyes that are just in front of the acelli that will help them locate their potential prey. Now, the region in front of the eyes is cylindrical to conical, hence the name cone nose bugs, right? So the cylindrical area, this is going to extend into the beak, or what we call the rostrum. And this makes up the piercing and sucking mouth parts. So the rostrum is held underneath the head when it's not at use. So like all these hemiptera, this group is parometabolous. So these insects, they're laid singly or in small groups, and they hatch 10 to 37 days after oviposition. It just depends on temperature and development and species. So they can develop through five nymphal instars. Now we can tell the nymphs versus the adults based primarily on things like their smaller eyes, uh, the lack of a celly. So nymphs do not have a celly. They also don't have wings. Instead, they have lobes on their wings where their wings will develop once they reach adulthood. So the nymphs tend to be uh, a slightly different color as well. They tend to be light pink or along those lines. And they will take a blood meal 48 to 72 hours right after they hatch. They need to engorge fully in order to molt into the next nymphal instar. And oftentimes that can take more than one blood meal. So they have to blood meal or they have to blood feed until they fully engorge. Then they can nymph into nymphal. <laughs> well, then they can molt into the next stage. 
both sexes and all stages require blood to develop. So everybody needs to feed. The females are going to blood feed and then she's going to mate. So she mates after blood feeding and she's going to produce 10 to 30 eggs in between her blood meals. She will lay one to two eggs per day until she's ready to feed and to mate again. This entire life cycle from egg through ovipositing adult can take as little as a few months, but most often will take one to two years, just depending on the amount of time that they can get blood meals. They have to go and find new prey, find places to lay their eggs. The temperature is, is highly, highly variable. So all of that works to this. So in nature, we tend to see this happening in one to two years. Now, these species are found in, you no. Know, really sheltered habitats for the most part, in nice, stable, sheltered habitats. And these habitats tend to be used by things like reptiles and birds and mammals for nests or roosts or burrows. So these reduviidae like to find places where there's a ready source of blood. Now we can divide these uh, reduviidae into three basic habitat groups, the sylvatic, the peridomestic, and the domestic bugs. So sylvatic bugs, these inhabit things like nests and burrows. They like natural hiding places like fallen logs or hollow trees, that sort of place. And they will feed on things like amphibians, lizards, possums, rodents, other small animals. Basically, sylvatic means rural. They mean far away from any type of disruption of the habitat by humans. Peridomestic, these will usually utilize domesticated animals as hosts. So think about oh, semi-disrupted areas like farmland or poultry habitats or uh, ranges where there's a lot of cattle. That's what we consider peridomestic. And so we tend to find this group of reduviidae in chicken coops or in stables, corrals, in rabbit pens. Finally, do the domestic group. Uh, these tend to colonize human habitations, and these are the ones that are most important to human health. So these will feed on humans or domesticated animals that are very closely associated with humans, like dogs and cats. They're often concealed in things like household materials, and they can be carried from one region to another in your car or in other vehicles. So these will, will come indoors and hide themselves inside or in your garage or in places like that and wait until you or your animals go to sleep in order to feed. Many of the domestic and peridomestic species are not exclusive, meaning they're not just going to feed on you or your dogs. They're not just going to feed on horses and cattle. Instead, they will exploit wild animals and um, other things when they come into their region. They just need a place to hide. So we can find these insects in cracks and crevices of natural and artificial materials. So we find them in building materials like wood and shingles. We find them in thatch and palm frond roofs. We can find them behind pictures or other wall hangings. They'll get lost in bedding, in the mattress. We'll find them in furniture, in boxes, in suitcases, piles of papers and clothing. Really anywhere that provides shelter during the day. And many of these species can survive for months without a blood meal. When there are hosts available, though, they will feed every four to nine days on average. So they're, they're pretty common with their feeding. Individual species do, do show host preference, and they may favor one host or another, like certain types of bats or birds or humans or armadillos. Right? So you will see these things nesting or hiding near where their preferred host lives. Like many hematophagous species, carbon dioxide is really the major draw for this insect. So it causes an increase in activity in these kissing bugs. So it's going to help them help to alert them to the presence of a host. There's also a pheromone in the feces of adult uh, kissing bugs or adult reduviidae that will attract the nymphs of their same species. Basically, it's mom and dad saying, hey, kids, here's some food. So it's going to alert them to the presence of these individual blood sources. Now, once this host is found, the amount of blood ingested really just depends on the duration of feeding. This tends to be governed by interesting things like nucleotides and phosphate derivatives of DNA that is found in the blood of the host. So this is going to stimulate the onset of the feeding. Uh, the 
end of feeding is going to be stimulated by stretch receptors found in the abdomen of the bug. So as soon as those stretch receptors are activated, the bug is going to stop feeding. Think about it as if you keep eating and your just stomach gets full, you're usually going to stop eating, right? So same exact idea happens. So stretch receptors say, hey, we're full, move along. Now, the saliva in Reduviti, this contains an anticoagulant, and this will maintain blood flow. It also contains nitric oxide. This is an antiplatelet, and it has a vasodilation effect. So nitric oxide will keep that blood from clotting. It will keep those platelets from coming to that open wound, and it will cause those veins and those uh, capillaries to dilate to allow more blood to show up to that blood feeder. Now, it takes somewhere between thir three and 30 minutes for a bu bug to fully engorge. The abdomen is going to become visibly distended during this time, and the adults may end up drinking about three times their body weight in blood. The blood is stored in the anterior midgut, and then it moves into the posterior midgut for ultimate digestion. Just after blood feeding, the bug is going to defecate on the host before it leaves. And this is where we get a lot of the vectoring capability of Reduviti. So, there are three major species of kissing bug that we find in this area that are medically and veterinarily important. The first you see here on the left. This is Triatoma sanguinosa. This is found in the southeastern U.S. We find it from about Pennsylvania to Florida and as far west as around Arizona. It can also be found down south through Latin America. It is found in both terrestrial and wooded environments where, the, where small mammals tend to live. This species tends to exploit animal nests as shelter and as their oviposition site. Their preferred host is the eastern wood rat. So we tend to see them most commonly associated with eastern wood rat nests. But they're also going to feed on other small mammals, uh, on horses, on raccoons, on armadillos, and every once in a while on humans if we walk into their natural habitat. So this species tends to live in colonies. These colonies are formed by one or more female and her newest brood of eggs. After those nymphs finish feeding and finish molting, they're going to move on to uh, their own places in order to nest. The nymphs and adults of this species are active most commonly during the warmer months. And when it gets cold, they're going to hibernate in rodent nests or other sheltered areas. And this species will focus on their host while it is sleeping. They secrete this anesthetic from their uh, saliva that allows the insect to feed for at least three to eight minutes without the host even noticing. Once it finishes blood feeding, it's going to hang upside down while digesting that blood meal somewhere in the vicinity of that host. So the nymphal uh, T. sanguinosa, these will avoid light, but the adults are attracted to it and actually use light to help them locate their hosts. On average, this species is pretty long-lived. It can live upwards of three years in the wild. All right, the second species is tri Triatoma um, gasteracuri. This is one of the most common assassin bugs found in Texas. So if you're out there looking for assassin bugs, uh, in Texas, you're probably going to find this one, but it's only really found in Texas and in New Mexico and then down into Mexico proper. So it's pretty limited in its range. They start to appear here in Texas right around late April. They peak in mid-May to early June, and then they'll start to drop off again when it gets cold. The numbers will decline through these cold months until they ultimately hibernate in late fall and early winter. And this is also a blood feeding species. It's primarily preys upon, again, wood rats, but also raccoons. It'll also focus on other small mammals that happen to be the area and the medium sized animals like dogs and coyotes and cats. And if it comes across a human, it will happily feed on humans. In Texas, this species has adapted to inhabiting dog kennels and dog houses. So it's especially common in these areas when these uh, dog houses or these kennels are in close association with wood rat nests. Finally, Triatoma protracta. This is commonly known as the Western Cone Nose, and this is the most important species of Reduviti in the Western U.S. So this species also exploits wood rats. So those poor wood rats are just getting fed upon by Triatoma species like mad. They'll, it'll 
also exploit things like pack rats as hosts and, and other wildlife, including humans. Their bite is often painless, much, much like uh, the, these other species, the triatoma, because they have that anesthetic in their sal saliva. But animals will experience a very intense itching or tenderness after the bite site after they stop pumping in that anesthetic. So after they finish feeding, it's going to start itching and be very, very tender. Now, all three of these species, they will take numerous blood meals every instar before they molt. And the adult is going to continuously blood feed over their lifetime. The more blood meal a kissing bug takes, the more likely it is to spread disease to whatever host they happen to be feeding upon. All right, that's the basics of Radioviti and some particular species. Let me know if you have any questions.